Hey, this is Steve in Dallas, Texas. It's Saturday morning, and you, my friend, are listening to Light Talk. And good morning. This is Stan in Gainesville, Florida. And today, we are speaking with the legendary lighting artist, show director, and producer, Mark Brickman on Light Talk. And this is David in beautiful Long Beach, California. And if you don't already know, you are listening to Light Talk, and we are the Lumen Brothers. Today, we continue our Legends of Lighting series with my all-time favorite rock and roll lighting and production designer, Mark Brickman. Hi, Mark. How are you? You, you're making me blush. <laughs> I've got your poster on the wall, you know, and, I, and every <laughs> night I, I, I kneel down and I pray that the what lighting poster? gods come touch me. Yes, the one with you up there. It's that Farrah Fawcett pose you did. <laughs> oh, wait, that, that, it was fair or false. Oh, I'm sorry, Mark. I got confused. Um, anyway, okay, oh, yeah. <laughs> Stan, why don't you tell us a little bit about Mark's truly amazing career? You know, I'm going to make it short because it's so incredible that if we did the whole thing, we wouldn't have time for the interview. And, you know, Mark is in my class every semester for the last 25 years doing this shtick that he did on some television magazine show years ago. So it is my honor to sort of read this to you. So let me just tell you a little bit about Mark, one of our legends of lighting. So we're just going to do some bullet points and get right into it. So in the music world, here's just a short list of some bands you might have heard of. Pink Floyd, Paul McCartney, Blue Man Group, Barbra Streisand, she's not really a group, Bruce Springsteen, David Gilmore, Whitney Houston, Neil Young, Nine Inch Nails, Film, Minority Report, AI, Artificial Intelligence, Sam Rami's Spider-Man, Running Man, iRobot, Cat in the Hat, and commissions at the Salzburg Festival, the 2012 relighting of the Empire State Building, Hans Zimmer Live in Prague, and on Broadway, Young Frankenstein, and recently, Once Upon a Dream, starring the Rascals. And that's just a few. So welcome to our humble little show, Mark Brickman. And David has our first question to get us rolling. Oh, by the way, you know, we should mention right now that Mark did this fantastic podcast with the geezers. That's right. We highly recommend people to check it out. I forgot the, the, the episode number, but, you know, we should do a link to that because it's really a really good interview. But we're going to sort of focus less on the technical areas and more on the art. So we're going to start off with, unlike many other live event designers, your design work is very theatrical. You create atmospheres and transitions and certainly tell a story with your designs. What do you attribute this to? Hmm, that's a good question. In the beginning, it, it wasn't conscious at, at all. Um, it, it was really all emotional in the moment. Uh, over the years, I began, um, I guess, searching for why people would come up to me and tell me, you know, this was incredible or you're a genius or all these things because it freaked me out. I, I, was, I was either <laughs> doing lights for Bruce Springsteen or I would have been homeless. Mm. So um, <laughs> I, I didn't I didn't I didn't understand what, what I was doing because I didn't get through college, um, even though I went to a very prestigious high school. What high school? It's called Central High School. It's the second oldest public high school in America. And um, it, it started in 1836. It's wow, second wow. to the Boston Public School. And it grad at the time when I went in the 60s and you know, I graduated in 70. It was an all boys school. And it took students from all over the city of Philadelphia. And he had to be admitted to the to the school. And uh, my, my father had gone there. And so I went there. It was a long trip from where I lived. There was a high school in walking distance from where I lived. But I had to get on three buses a day. So I read a lot. And then I, so I started really reading about art and, and light. And, and cinematographers, started meeting cinematographers, started, you know, meeting real artists, um, started learning about painting. I basically educated myself in, you know, in a very basic course of art history. I guess I started really understanding what I was doing because I didn't want to overthink it. I think if you overthink something, you get bogged down in the minutia, you know, and music back then was very spontaneous. There, there weren't really you know, tracks running with backup vocals and time codes for all the video and everything had to be right to the second. Even with Pink Floyd, they would have a click track counting them in. Um, and that was the first time I came up to that. I mean, Bruce was four hours of just untamed 
you know, you know, mm. savagery <laughs> yeah. back yeah. then. So <laughs> rock and roll, baby. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it was that. It, you know, and among that, I there was Carol King and Jackson Brown and the whole West Coast side of the music business that um, that I got involved in. But Bruce Bruce taught me how to be spontaneous by just being savage. That's probably the word. There was just you know, take no prisoners. He destroyed wow. every audience. So, you know, when I got to Pink Floyd, they had counts just to keep the film in sync, even though it really wasn't. It was a wild sync. And so they counted in. So everybody started on time and then the click would go off. That's interesting. There, there was a couple of other like segments like on the run when we would have to let the plane off. We would as soon as the film started, we'd start to click. So you were, you know, it was like thirty-two to thirty-four seconds. You had it before the end that you had to had to say go for the for the plane <laughs> or the bed. Hmm. Um, but I, I just learned I learned by by actually working all the time. That that list you read is pretty scary. <laughs> Made me really tired. In a good way. In a good way. Yeah. It's great. Yeah, I got really, yeah. I got exhausted listening to it. You know. you know, just to follow up, you know, you're, we were talking about the, the theatrical uh, nature of your designs. You know, you mentioned Pink Floyd, uh, you know, obviously the Genesis, a lot of these other great theatrical type bands. So these are, these, this is music that tells a story. It's, it's really interesting that that's how you started this, you know, and you really didn't well, overthink it. It was all Bruce. It. Yeah, yeah, it was all Bruce because when Bruce... In the beginning, we had 24 lights, but when he would start telling these stories, to have him in a foul spot didn't feel right to me. It was a mm. feeling. It just didn't feel right. That's I wanted it to be, in my mind, what I was looking at, I wanted it to be more mysterious. I didn't want to see his face. Mm. Right. You know, I, I wanted him to be every man, mm. and um, so everybody could relate to him. He, he wasn't, like, being pointed out with a light, you know. He was just really more of a painting but i didn't know that i was doing that it, it wasn't conscious it's like jazz yes exactly a little follow just a small follow up do you think that you were born with that artistic intuition i think everyone has the ability to be an artist i was reading i saw david burns show twice mm. in the last month in on broadway and he talks about you know, when you're born, you have millions of connections and then you, you, you know, you lose them over time, these connections, you know, because you get, mm. you, you're taught to look at other things. And, and I've mm. been reading a lot of books lately about, you know, because there's so much focus on people's behavior these days and you have all these labels. But at the end of the day, I, I think that, you know, each of us are born with all the same abilities, but some come to the forefront um, naturally and maybe even environmentally, you know, at times. But I, I, I don't get hung up in it too much. I mean, like I said, for me, it was survival. I just had to work because I wanted to eat. And um, I think at the end of the day, it's just a basic human function to eat. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I've heard that. I read a book about eating. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Mark, could you tell us a little more about designing in the moment? Because you use that term a lot. It's a term that yeah. I use as well. Uh, I'm just curious how you came to this process. Well, with Bruce, you never knew what song he was playing. You never <laughs> knew what, what and, and he would, it would be visual cues. He'd tug on his ear. You'd see him turn around to the band. He, he'd like kick his elbow out or, hmm. you know, you know, something would happen. And so, it, and back then it was a two scene preset. There wasn't mm. like a whole hog or a grand MA or, or disguise or all these things that you have to think about first before you can operate <laughs> them, right? I mean, if you really think about that for a second, it's like you said, jazz, you have an instrument, a manual instrument, and you're playing with some other people and, you know, you, 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 you need to stay in the groove. Um, that's, that's, that's exciting. Do you play a music instrument, I mean, Mark? Did you play an I, instrument? I, play, I, I played clarinet when I was young. My uncle was in the big bands. He was oh. a saxophone player, and he gave me a clarinet when I was, when I was young. Um, I play some ukulele now. 
I was actually just in New York, and not only did I see David Byrne, I saw two nights at Lincoln at Jazz Center with, um, it was Steve Miller hosting all the, this really young um, sextet that's been nurtured by Lincoln at Jazz Center and Wynton Marce- Marcellus, and, and um, it was amazing. These guys mm. and the vocalist were just, uh, it was from another planet, uh, the weekend really put my faith back into real musicians playing real music with real instruments, you know, and David Byrne put my faith back into, you know, an, ar- an artist in his later years, not just playing the hits to, mm. for the sake of Live Nation and all the other promoters and Ticketmaster. Right. Uh, for a moment three years ago, he and I had chatted about what was in his head and I did some drawings for him. I was very excited because I've always been a huge fan. And then, um, I don't know, something happened, of course, in the business side of it, you know, because artists aren't allowed to be artists anymore. They have mm-hmm. to fit into this formula, you know, the line item. I mean, all the way down the line, there's really nothing out there that's spontaneous because it, it there's so much thought that goes into every last aspect of it. It takes away... The, the magic, which is the spontaneity of, because we're not there to look at huge sets that have been erected by some people, um, you know, that, that I don't, I'm not, still not sure how they relate. And um, you, you're there, or you used to be there for the music. But, but uh, I mean, it's, those are really all good questions. And obviously, I don't want to sound like a grumpy old man, and I'm starting to, so I better shut up. <laughs> Next <know>. question. Uh, <laughs> you fit right in. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Steve has our next question. Well, you, you, you may have actually already answered this. You know, you opened a door a second ago, and you talked about being spontaneous. You talked about there was a day in which there was no grand MA. It was just the lighting designer and a headset and a two-scene preset board. I mean, your career has spanned some real uh, technology developments, new consoles, new fixtures, projection, digital media. My question to you is, how has technology affected your approach to design? Without being egomaniacal, um, and I really don't like being that, but in 1987, when I was, you know, asked to join the reincarnated Pink Floyd, um, very Light had just come out. And I went and watched Alan Owen's show with Genesis, which was mind blowing, <laughs> absolutely fucking mind blowing. But the one thing I noticed right off the bat was I couldn't do a whole show with those lights going back and forth, wiggling around in one space. So I went away and realized if I used less lights, but I was able to move them, that I could have one that could still maintain my style, my style of darkness and light and and highlighting the music, bringing the music visually in a visual interpretation of the music of who was playing in the moment at the time, where you naturally would feel watching it, you know. And so I was able to move these very lights in an X, Y, Z. Well, once I did that, then I realized I could have a few different types of these new lights, like telescans, I could have, I'd have, I'd have pods, I'd have motors. Suddenly there was like this, I had a bunch of, you know, really talented guys around me. And then I was, I added lasers in and fiber rays and, and I added, I mean, you know, Pink Floyd really wanted something different. So, so I think what happened was, um, I, I created this team, a band, my own band, of technicians, which is now our standard way of operating. Um, but I kept it very in the way they were programming those boards because they were so basic that we just set parameters that still that everyone ran live. In other words, they would run their consoles live, live, just like I used to run a two scene preset. No, no, you know, obviously the pods had a lot of safety issues, but we still everyone manually was running things in the moment, you know, um, and, and everybody was paying attention. So it was like having my own jazz band. Um, I don't know if it works. I mean, when I do a show, it does still work that way. For most parts, I've been on shows where, you know, uh, they push the button, the time code starts, and everybody gets coffee. You wow. Know? Um, it's, 
Yeah, I can't even convince a student to use a fader. They just say, what are those for? You can tell your students that in 1987, one night sitting in the Toronto airport at 3 a.m., the laser table caught fire. <laughs> and so, and, and, and when the laser table caught fire, we were all kind of, you know, to say we weren't, you know, bright and eyed and bushy tailed the first thing in the morning. So we all looked at these flames going up behind the stage and kind of, um, Wow, man, that's cool. <laughs> we, we, yeah, we, exactly. That's exactly what happened. And then suddenly everybody jumped up and freaked out. We ran back there. We put the fire out. We turned all the power off. You know, we got the fire out. We, we all saw these headlines, you know, Pink Floyd crew burns down Toronto airport. So, um, because back then you could you could re rehearse in the hangars and not go through the stuff you go through now. But um, we when we finally got back to the consoles at about four a.m., they powered everything back up, and I'm sitting there. The screen comes back on, and there were the VL threes, I think, back then. And when they initialized, they did their initialization, but then they swung into the screen. They spun around like everybody <laughs> loves that look. They spun around, then they float, they like floated back out toward us and mm. then went back in and did the iris move and then mm. stopped. And I looked at the screen and then I remember looking at Dale Polanski going, that's it, man. That's exactly what I've been looking for. You know, just, that's it. I'm going home now. You make that happen and I'm happy. We can go. That's yeah. great. That's great. And so I would tell your students that maybe they should look at the fader. They might discover something. When I first saw that cue, I said, how did he come up with this? This is so brilliant because it's, like it's, it's like a kaleidoscope and it's just like sweeping across. It was a mistake. The, I know. <laughs> it was a mistake. <laughs> a mistake. And, 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 and I got to be honest with you, a lot of some of the, my favorite moments in some shows have always been a mistake. Absolutely. They've been, they've been, I've been, we've been doing things, pushing buttons, not really getting there. Um, and then suddenly somebody might push the wrong button and I would, I would, I've always got my eyes open. And it's a mistake. That's the key. That's the beautiful you know? thing. You just said it is that you that you had the eyes to see it as something more than a mistake. You saw it as something use as art, right? You had the you had your eyes open. You were watching, and you went, "Hey, that's cool." It doesn't matter how it got there, does it? Right? <laughs> you know? Yeah, and that that so technology actually, if it's not taught correctly, you know, like for instance, so everybody used to watch those shows and they emulated it, and I'm very flattered. But what they didn't really ever pick up on was what I just said, was that it wasn't because it was so thought out. It was the fact that uh, I'm just always open to opportunity and I then I have to make a choice. And really, I mean, that that's for me, I guess, the way I, I do things. You have to be that way to be a musician. Being a musician is listening. I mean, if you're in jazz band, you have to listen to what everyone else is doing. And it's the same thing in light. Because you're listening to everybody. Yes. It's fantastic. It's a good place for the follow-up question, Steve. Um, and I think Mark's already answered it. I guess the question is, as we enter into this kind of arms race <laughs> with a new piece yeah, of right. lighting equipment every week, right? Uh, do, you, do you think that that's getting in the way? Do you think that people are, are not... Uh, what can I say? They're not creating anything. They're just looking for that effect... And so we see it hit in that show, and then we never see it again because no one wants to use that effect because it's been used. Well, when you say that effect, it's usually the effect that the engineers in in you know at the comp at the manufacturers exactly, yeah, and you're relying on them, and they never come out and see the shows. They're they're, they're <laughs> caught in their ones and zeros. You know, that's the last thing they want to do is like go on tour and 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 let even the pain and suffering of the crew bus, um, um, you know, inform your decisions because you're so worn out that you. But then you suddenly see something that lifts you up. I I but you know, look. When I started, that was a time that will never be repeated. We're in a completely different, you know, day and age now. I think, though, we're still all human. And I think that what, what gets failed to be taught, and that's just basic education starting back when you're first born, is just mystery, not having everything so revealed. It's like, you know, it's a social media, is, for me, is, is great. 
but you know everything in moderation uh, and um I just you know but again I I sound like an old man I think I'd probably would feel a little bit better about it if everything just wouldn't be repeated and look exactly the same like I said like David Burnshell he he was on this from the very first moment and he embraced the technology but dialed it back to simplicity I don't think there's very many of the of the lighting, they all think more and more and more, and I'm not criticizing them, but they are in a pattern, especially at the big shows, where it's it's these and and you know they think they have to have the newest greatest light that's out there, but at the end of the day, if you start with darkness, you know, and you turn a flashlight on, you're gonna feel something. Well, maybe maybe the follow up question is who's getting in the way. Is it the manager? Is it the producer? Is it, is it the record label who's saying, you know, don't take any chances right now. Just give us the show that we know will sell a ticket. No, because that's always been present, that, that, that attitude. But I think what's different is that the artists themselves aren't that involved to begin with. They're more involved in their social media and brand marketing and how they can become more and more famous, which then trickles down to the agents and the promoters. And, and then you're dealing with now with like, a, you know, one promoter in the world who does everything. And not that they tell you what your show should look like, but they have certain line items. There's a certain expectation. If you don't have a big LED screen, well, the audience isn't going to be happy. I don't know how many times I've been told that. And I'm like, and how do you know that? How do you know the audience isn't going to be happy? I mean, like, like just because you had it there last week, you think you have to have it again this week? You know, that was somebody else's. That was another band. That's not this band. Why do you have to have the screen? Why? Guess what? What? Like Cheryl Sandberg says, you know, why don't you have to lean in? You know, I mean, just I don't get it. I, I mean, we promote one thing, but nobody has the courage to. to and it's usually the big bands. It's going back to your Bruce Springsteen statement about I want to see him in dark or he's every man. There's not a follow spot mm -hmm. picking him out. You know, without naming any names, I know an artist who opened their show in about, oh, 30 seconds of backlight. And that lasted one performance. And the manager was at the desk saying, you know, five seconds. And then mm -hmm. let's get some light on the face. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that, I mean, that's, that's it right there. I mean, thir first of all, when you said to me 30 seconds, I'm like, what, what are you kidding me? I mean, <laughs> and, and, and the manager's going five, okay, in this day and age, 10. But to be honest with you, what it does is it sets up an expect, you know, you have an expectation. The reason you go to a show is because you have an expectation. And your expectation is not the big LED screens and the massive set built by, you know, on, on, on that whole other IPO level, you know, what, it, what it's about is your expectation of being able to connect not only with the artist, but with the other audience members. Yeah. You're not home in your house anymore. So now this is a connection. So all bets are off, really. It doesn't, it's not going to change the fact of what you do outside of that arena. Yeah. You know, it'll enhance what all the efforts of the manager and the record company and the agents and Live Nation and everybody else if the show was different. But if immediately you see something that you could watch on TV, that's why people are walking away. If they don't start with a hit, people are walking down the aisles because they're bored. There's nothing mm -hmm. to look at. You save you know? your money all year to go yeah. see your to see that exactly. band. Yeah, I mean, you, let could, them you, could, surprise you, could, you could stay home and listen to them on a, a great set of headphones. You go there to see the music. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. And and that's and that's the disconnect. The disconnect. And and I got to be honest with you. You know, it's twenty seven years now, or no, twenty five, somewhere around. Yeah, twenty five years since we did Pink Floyd. You know, Pulse. Then the Stones are out there. Then there was U two, and you know, I. And Willie Williams and Mark Fisher were always a great team. Mark Fisher and myself were always a really great team because I loved Mark and I miss him. And um, I think that during the period of the 90s, those shows had such an effect on everyone that the young designers that are out there now, that's what they grew up looking at. Because they were young, they probably remembered the really big spectacle moments they did they weren't really understanding the rest of it i don't think because they were right. probably in a in a stadium they weren't in a theater 
Right. And they and a lot of people probably don't go to theater anymore. But theater yeah. is really where it starts. It, theater is is intricate to um, the people learning how to think differently. Because in theater, you will see darkness, and you will, you know, go to a ballet. I mean, go to th- your community theater. Do something that is not on the screen, you know, where it's a connection with live human beings. And I think, you know, I don't think you can, I could sit here and preach and everyone's going to stop using all the buttons that all these consoles come with. But I think maybe another generation could learn um, how to how to maybe, you know, really appreciate all the depth of the artists that are out there in the world. Not just myself. You know, I, I, I'm, I still don't understand why people study me. So <laughs> right. I think that's just stupid. But You're anyway. sort of an icon in some ways, you know. Yeah, I don't get that. Maybe it's that really leads right into Stan's question. It does. Okay. Stan, well, that's I, a perfect I, I thought I thought that I, I will, but I, I thought you sort of answered it, but maybe I'll ask the question and see where you go with it. So I'm fascinated on your thoughts of, you know, Chattoscuro, of light and shadow, because your work is so highly theatrical. You you use contrast to great effect. So And darkness is a key element. But, you know, you talk about what's missing in, in lighting education, how to train young people to think about darkness. And although I have a hard time telling my students to turn the light on sometimes, they think <laughs> about darkness too much. And, and it's a balance, right? So... You know, so why do you think many designers are sort of afraid of the dark or afraid of the light or of making that that theatrical picture that you were so good at? You, you're right about one thing. They're not afraid of the dark because they don't light the bands anymore. I'm not talking about the big shows. They, none of the bands are ever lit. It, the audience is always lit. Mm. Um, <laughs> and again, that's another one of these. They expect to be lit. You know, you know, the audience needs to be lit because they're they're part of the show. Well, that's gotten so that's been taken so far to that in air graphics. <laughs> air graphics are like, yeah, you know, like, OK, um, <laughs> right. but but I mean, I I understand what you're saying, but I think it's about scale. So if 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 you have the darkness in a theater or, you know, or your students are afraid, that's good. But when they start putting one light on at a time, they start seeing something, you know, they start. It's always the negative space between the light, you know. Right. So I, when right. I talk about the darkness, I'm also talking about the negative space, which makes people larger than life. Um, but uh, yeah, the the bands are really dark these days, <laughs> and and they're paying for it. No one's ever going to speak to me again after this, but it's okay. No, I don't know about that. This might help. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, hey, so Mark, I saw your Rascal show, Once Upon a Dream, at the Greek a couple of years ago. Uh, it was excellent. I really, I really loved it. And, you know, Thank you. partially because I'm a huge Rascals fan. Could you tell us how you got involved in that project? You know, when I left Springsteen, I, there was, I still had, you know, I was still friends with the band. And um, Stevie Van Zandt and myself stayed and have stayed friends all these years. So he called, and that was his lifelong dream, was to, Right, you know, we were like the we we were like Zero Mostel and uh, Gene and, Wilder. And, um, and Gene Wilder, you know. Uh, Stevie was Steve, Zero Mostel, and I was Gene Wilder, you know. And um, it we it, it yeah, it, that's how we got there. Um, it I, I got to tell you, the Rascals. When I was a kid, I just loved the Rascals, and when I Dino Donelli was my hero, and when I finally like met him. And then I had to deal with him and Felix over a course of, you know, right. a year. Uh-huh. Um, um, yeah. That, <laughs> you know, sometimes it's not great to meet your heroes. It's like when I was working on um, AI, I had been working on it for a while. And then one day Kathy Kennedy said to me, the producer said, oh, we want you to meet Steven. And I went, that's OK. I don't want to meet Steven. I'm fine. Honest. I mean, I, you know, it's cool. He's a God. So let, how about I don't meet him? I, you know, it's just, <laughs> I don't, I, I, look, those guys were are historical. They were, it was, it was great to put them back together again. Um, but you know, sometimes you can't go backwards. Right. And, um, so it was fun. I'm glad it happened. We have great memories. We had a great run on Broadway. Right. We actually made money. You know, so it was it was an amazing time, amazing 18 months I spent. So I can thank Stevie for that. 
Well, I would say let's continue with some of this early work. How did you get started with Pink Floyd? Well, I had been touring with Bruce for quite a while, um, from like 1972. And in um, 1977 or 78, 78, I moved out here to L.A. I left uh, Mammoth Beach. <laughs> um, and um, I started working for other people also, like Boz Skaggs. And oh, yeah. I started working for Carol King and, like I said, Jackson and, um, you know, other people. And uh, it was it was just around this time, um, actually 40 years ago, <laughs> almost to the day, almost to the day. It was a week before Christmas. No, or maybe. Yeah, I think it was. It was. I, I don't know that you could probably look up the date, but Pink Floyd, everyone knew, had been building the show at the sports arena for like well over a month. Everybody in town knew that. They were spending millions of dollars, and it was a rock opera on the grandest scale. My phone rings and in my studio in West L.A., and uh, I get a, um, a call, and it says, you know, he asked for me in a British accent, and I said, it was, it was me. And they said, well, this is Steve O'Rourke. I'm Pink Floyd's manager, and we're having a bit of a problem down here. And so I thought... It was one of my British friends winding me up. So in my notorious wise guy uh, that I am, I said, I'm so happy you called. I need 25 tickets for tomorrow night. <laughs> and, and what you heard on the phone was silence. And then you heard this. I don't think you understand. I am Steve O'Rourke. I am Pink Floyd's manager. We're having a bit of a problem down here. Would you <laughs> mind coming down to visit us immediately? And I said, oh, uh, yeah, sure. So um, I went down there. And, um, you know, at that, the Pink Floyd in my life, musically, I was a fan, as other people were. But I was mostly, David Gilmore was the one, because they were like an anonymous band. Right. Mm. You know, they really were. Love that. And Gilmore was the one that I really had clicked into up to that point. So when I got down there, I was introduced to Gerald Scarf first. I didn't know who he was. Then Roger came out. I was introduced to Roger. And then they took me for a tour of what they had been doing. And it was mind blowing. I mean, it was, mm -hmm. it was just out of, you know, nobody had even attempted anything like this ever. And I, and they said to me, we're in a bit of a jam. There's something missing and we need your help. Would you mind coming back this evening for a dress rehearsal? Then tell us what you think. So I said, okay. So I went away and came back a few hours later and they didn't think I was going to come back. <laughs> they thought they had scared me. And, um, I watched the show and I brought a set of three by five cards with me and I wrote all these notes. And after the rehearsal, I was ushered into Roger's trailer. And uh, I think it was Roger and Gerald, but I'm not sure. It might have just been Roger and me. And we started talking. And he said, well, what did you think? I said, well... You know, everything is on all the time right from the get-go. So I didn't know what the hell was going on, but I did write a whole lot of notes, and I started going through the notes. And he said, well, what would be the first thing you would do? I said, the first thing I would do is not bring the cherry pickers up on the downbeat of the first song. I said, I would save the cherry pickers. Yep. Because you, you have pyro in the first song, you have pyro going off, the band's here, you got a chat, ghost band behind you. Nobody knows what the fuck's going on. And I said, I would, I'd wait until you get to another brick in the wall, part two, where you hear this helicopter sound. And I'd say I'd start it in darkness, and then the cherry pickers come up during the helicopter yeah, sound. Yeah. I, I think if we can start with that, you know, I think we, we that would become the you know the way we can work together you know where where i need to turn things off you know i mean i don't need to put any more things on so when we do really big things they matter you know right. i mean you're opening tomorrow night <laughs> you know <laughs> so as soon as i said that he oh yeah somebody else was there he turns to somebody and goes get me graham so graham fleming came in who 
I didn't know was the lighting designer, but he was also part owner of Britannia Row at the time. And he walks in and Roger looks at him and goes, you're fired. You have oh, cotton in your ears. Oh, you know? no. <laughs> and, oh God. <laughs> and um, I looked at Graham and he looked at me like he was going to kill me, you know. And um, I mean, we became friends later. Sure. But um, and then he goes, you're dismissed. And <laughs> and Graham leaves. Right. They're very British. <laughs> and then he looks at me and he says, right. He goes. Well, we open tomorrow night, <laughs> so you have a lot of work to do, and so you're dismissed, right? And I, and so, oh, Steve O'Rourke was there, so he walks out with me, and uh, and I'm like, now I'm like, what the fuck did I get myself into? <laughs> so I walk through the vomitorium, and as I walk through, there's like you know 200 guys working on this thing. It's the last night before it was. And suddenly you hear all the work come to a stop. It was like that Merrill Lynch commercial where, you know, the, <laughs> yeah, everything gets really yeah, quiet, but. you know. And I'm thinking, oh, I'm really fucked up. Um, and then two guys start walking toward me and they both walk up to me. And the one guy goes, hi, I'm Robbie Williams and, and I'm in, in charge of the sound. And the other guy goes, hi, I'm Mark Fisher. And I think you need our help. And um, I, that they became my best friends in, for years. Um, and somehow we, we got through it, you know. Graham almost killed me the next night. He was still there. He didn't get fired. <laughs> but, I, <laughs> but, I mean, um, yeah, that, that was how I started with Floyd. That's amazing. Wow. Well, let me ask you a question, and this may be too sensitive to answer. Did you get your 25 tickets? <laughs> <laughs> I'll say yes over the years, and a lot more than that, you know. So I'll I'll say yes to that. I did. Maybe not that night, but um, I did. Since we're talking about Pink Floyd, I have a couple of follow-ups here because I saw Pink Floyd in 1970 in Fort Lauderdale, <laughs> sitting in the dirt, you know. And their big lighting effect was basically cranking up the genie towers at the very beginning, and then having a mirror ball at the end. It was always about the music, the sound, and it was about these spatial effects. And then I saw the Division Bell tour, which is the Pulse, you know, from the Pulse DVD. And it's interesting because the very first song of that concert was Astronomy Domine. And right. you used a lot of like the liquid light effects or it was a film that looked like liquid light effects. No, they were real. They, in 94, yeah, they were real. That was, yeah. that was real. So they actually I, used the yeah. overhead. Oh, that's really cool. I used it for that. And also I used it for, uh, we had a bunch of uh, uh, telescan projectors out there and I had adapted two of them. Uh, I adapted two of them to be overhead projectors or one of them and and we could write on the film too and the beginning of another brick and roll you see this hand come in and cross it out that was that was live I didn't know that that was all done live live wow no very impressive neither one no we had a no the oils were the oils were real too well you know back when in the first um, the first Dark Side of the Moon tour they had, and I, I explained, I was talking about this on the show because we were talking about how to light a mirror ball. And I was talking about that moment sitting in the dirt and watching Eclipse. And they basically had a light box. And in front of this light box, they had this uh, mirror ball that was cut in half that was spinning clockwise. And right when it hit the corona of the Eclipse, they hit it with some follow spots and it was like this amazing effect. And that mirror ball sort of like continued as an iconic Pink Floyd thing. And then you ended up with this gigantic mirror ball in Division well, Bell. Well, <laughs> yeah. That, I mean, it, it was it, David basically told the same story to, to me. And we and Mark Fisher rejoined us. He wasn't there in 87 because right. the camp split and he went off with Roger. But um, I went with David. And when he when he I suggested he come back for 94, I had mm -hmm. designed I had already designed the uh, the Hollywood Bowl looking structure, um, mm -hmm. and um, Fisher built it um, along with Robbie, um, and you know Mark's 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 was just amazing. So we got to the Mirror Ball, and Mark obviously had been around for those shows, and so he actually 
you know, with all of us, we, but it was, you know, he just took it and put it on steroids. I mean, the funny <laughs> part about that was actually the mirror ball was a distraction for us just to get back to the 25 tickets again, was a distraction <laughs> for us to build that huge mix area in the middle where there was a hundred guest seats, which I was in charge of. So when I said uh, that I did get, uh-huh. yeah. <laughs> and Michael Cole was not happy about that. They were 100 tickets off manifest. You know what I mean? Uh-huh. Well, that took a lot of yeah. space. That was a huge footprint. Yeah, if you could look yeah, at it. Yeah, well, that, <laughs> I, I said to Fisher, I said, mm-hmm. well, if you're going to put that out back behind me, then I want a huge, you know, I want a, I want a guest area in front of me with a nightclub underneath. And there was. You know, there was this nightclub <laughs> underneath the guest area where the band would come out and play, including David and Nick. You know, they'd come out too. Sometimes at intermission and the crowd never even knew, you know. Wow. Um, and, and they would play for the guests. I mean, we would have our parties out there. And that, and that was Mark and I being mischievous because – that was really in the beginning when Cole was doing his, you know, his 360 deals with the Stones and us. And then it was U2 and then it was Madonna, you know, which begot Live Nation. And, um, yeah, the mirror ball was so big. Um, and the, and, How big and the, was and it? Stru- it was a 30, 30, it opened to 36 feet in diameter, and I David think. David was right on. And, yep, I was right yeah, on. I said David, 40 feet. Yeah. You That's did. pretty amazing. Yeah, I think it was, thir- I th- I'm pretty sure it was thir- 36 feet. They auctioned off those panels, the leaves, really? two years ago. They still, they, <laughs> they told me they were saving one for me over in England. But, ah. you know, the ship it over here is just stupid. You know, that's just like, uh, you know. Where are you going to put uh, it? It. <laughs> I put it in my backyard, but it comes I'm already in trouble. Yeah. yeah, I'm in trouble with my with my neighbors already because <laughs> Phillips okay, had lit my, have, has lit my property. And, I know, saw we, that that I, was advertised yeah. on the Phillips website. Yeah, your, I know. I, I, yeah. I, I get in trouble. I get, it got vandalized last week. Oh no! Actually, oh. and I didn't. And just remembered, I didn't call my insurance guy today. <laughs> 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 yeah. I, I've got the next question, which is sort of moving into the future a little bit or, or your present. So could you tell us a little bit about how your work in concert lighting led you to the art that you're making now? Because you mentioned on the Geezer's podcast, Leo Villarreal and James Terrell, both people I have a lot of respect for. And tell us about your entry into the world of fine arts. You know, I'll get back to David Byrne. You know, he's 73 now. David Gilmore's 73. I'm hanging out with Steve Miller. He's 76. Roger Waters is probably 74. I mean, if you really, I'm going to be 67. If you don't continually change and try to um, continue exploring and challenging yourself, I mean, I don't know. I mean, to me, that's that's not really being an artist. I mean, if I'm walking around telling people I'm an artist now, I need to be doing other things. Mm-hmm. And so, um, and obviously with technology the way it is, now you really could do this type of, I'm working on some things right now that are really very interesting with some young uh, video artists and coders and things that are part of the company, the collective we have called Tactical Maneuver. We, we have a, um, an, an artist collective. And so I have young people that work with me. And, um, and when I say young, it sounds like I'm really old, but no, they're all artists. They're, they're in their twenties and thirties and, um, amazing. Um, and we, we all have a really good time. I like being dad. Um, and, uh, <laughs> you know, I, are you hoping to see some of that work, uh, be commissioned or landed in museums and kind of give well, a, a, le- a legacy to I, your sort of like you're taking your talent and then, giving it to society in, a, in sort of a permanent collection of some kind? Is that sort yeah, of Yeah, I mean, I did, a, I did a film four years ago that finally uh, went on permanent exhibition at the Empire State Building mm-hmm. um, three weeks ago. Um, and, and the owner of the building was, has been very kind to me. And he, they, um, they put me in the new big, you know, exhibition. You know, they have this whole new experience there. Mm. Um, and they spent a lot of money and they've featured me on the 80th floor. So that's wow. my first real installation. Yes. But yeah. and, and it's treated as an art piece. Right. We have another art installation at, at um, another one of his buildings in, mid, in Manhattan, a very prominent building. And that's treated as a uh, as a gallery installation, even though it's not in the 
you know, let's say the mainstream galleries. And, you know, we, we look at ourselves as artists, um, plain and simple, you yeah. know, so just, that's what we do. Very cool. Yeah. Your, the website is great. I stumbled into it. That's how I got your email. And, uh, but you're sort of, you're sort of stealth in a way. And uh, then I realized it was you and, 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 um, I'm excited for you. I'm excited to, as a, as a, somebody who's looked at your work over the years to see what you produce now is also very exciting for me and for the young people should be following your work. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I appreciate that. And it's, it's fun. I mean, it's just, it's, it's good to, to be alive and I have a 10 year old daughter, so I, I have to stay current. Right. Um, you know, very yeah. cool. Uh, let's go back for a second. And I, I just want to tell a real quick story. When I was teaching at SMU many, many, many years ago, uh, one day Jim Waits gave me a call and he said, what are you doing tonight? And I said, oh, nothing. He goes, grab your students, come to Texas Stadium. He goes, tonight's the final dress rehearsal for the Genesis, the way we walk tour. And, you know, come on in. You could look at the lighting rig. You check out the show, you know, meet, you know, the designer. At the time, I didn't know it was Mark. And uh, we did. We went down there to Texas Stadium. There's probably about 200, 250 people there, you know, in the audience in Texas Stadium, if you can imagine. And we saw this amazing show. And after, I, I forgot if it was after or before, uh, Jim introduced us to Mark. And uh, it was great. The students were thrilled. Uh, and it was a fantastic design. And Mark did a lot of, uh, so, some of the things you never did before, like using those jumbotrons as a, uh, as a video projection screen, which was amazing. On railroad tracks. And you had, didn't you have guys driving them? Didn't, weren't they manually driven? They were. Um, it, it, it was the first time, <laughs> you know, that you had like a large scale screen. It was before LED. Right. The Jumbotron was state of the art. Um, and they, they moved. Yeah. Um, and um, there, was, there was a lot of really interesting people. Geiger Engineering out of New York were actually the, the um, people that, and the water ballast underneath the PA were huge. To, to allow those lights to go up and down the wires. And also, it helped support the railroad tracks. They were railroad tracks in the back. They, they, it was crazy. That's um, interesting. Morris Lida, who lives in Australia, I just spoke to him last week. He was our production manager, mad genius. He, he, anything I would say he would just go and do. I mean, he was completely crazy, you know, and he had been gen with Genesis for years, and I dearly love Morris. He was a character. Those were the days when there wasn't, you know, the accountants and the promoters and, you know, everybody was independent and people expected these bands to surprise them. And yep. the bands were very involved artistically and nobody said no. Nobody mm -hmm. talked about their, you know, their brand presence or any of the other stuff. You know, it was a different time. Right. So it allowed that there was a lot of room to be creative. And to spend money. It was like the golden age of rock and roll uh, design yeah. because, yeah. you know, you had enough technology that you could create some incredible theatrical moments. You know, Stevie Van Zandt always said it, and he's, he's said it for years, that we've lived through the Renaissance, you know, yeah. or the right. Renaissance, right. you know, a second time. And he said golden age also. I, I just must tell you that. There, there are songs on that DVD, and, and you know, again, uh, it's this concert, this tour is actually out on DVD. It's a decent uh, filming of it, especially if we consider the time. But there are songs that I use in class to show my students some. What, the it, Genesis is yes. out there? I never saw it. Oh, yeah. I mean, never re yeah, they released that? Yes. I never, well, yes, I never look at my work. Oh, you should check it out. I don't know, man. Mark, I'll send you a copy because I have, I, I think I have an extra No, one. that's okay. I, I, not after I tell you what I'm going to say. So they sent me from, from, from Sony the new Pink Floyd, you know, the latter years or whatever. And I, and I was in, I came back from New York after Thanksgiving. He was sitting on my table and I looked at it I opened the box and then I just looked at it. And it said <laughs> from 1987 to 2019. And I did the math and I went, fuck, that's like half my life in that box. I'm not opening it. But, you know, I mean, and it's still sitting, it's still sitting on my table a month later now. I have not opened it. I, t I called London and I told, thanked everybody for sending me the box and thinking right. of me. But then I said, do you know, 
I can't go into a Costco because I get overwhelmed. So <laughs> I can't open your box set. I'm, I'm sorry. Is a great story. Not, don't take it personally. Gonna, well, that's well, a great story. Well, well, for our listeners out there, I believe it's called um, The Way We Walk. And it's a live concert of this tour that we're talking about right now. And I forgot what year it was, Mark. It was before Pulse. I know that. Uh, but I must tell you that there's some exquisite lighting design in that. Uh, driving the last spike, home by the sea. I'm going to just go on and on about using darkness and using conventions and using magnificent work of the lights moving, you know, <laughs> like Mark says, actually moving on a truss, on, on the wires. It's just beautiful yeah, work. So I, again, you know, bravo to that. Uh, I just had to mention it. Thank you. Well, as they say, all good things come to an end. It's time to put on your Yoda costume and give a little advice to our high school students and college students listening in today. Um, you know, I would say close your eyes and listen to the music. Mm. Don't watch a video. Don't, mm. don't even read anything about the band. Just listen to the music. I mean, if that's that type of design. But then if you're a theatrical designer, I mean, even to the EDM people, just listen to what the DJs are doing. You know, I mean, they're making music. They are. They got the beats. Um, but just close your eyes and then think about what you want to see, but not, you know, what you really want to see. Right. That's probably That's some Yoda advice. But in, th in the, th the theatrical world, you know, um, I, I think it's it's the same thing. It's, you know, you read the script, you close your eyes, you start thinking about the story, you read it again, you know, and you start dreaming about it, then you start collaborating. Collaboration's a really big, big deal. Maybe try to even engage the artist, you know. Yeah. But not on just technology, not on what's the newest, coolest thing that some engineer. It's cool that they have that, but, the, you know, it's, it's how you use it. Right. Wow. Beautiful. Well, Mark, thank you so much for being on Light Talk today and, uh, <laughs> and allowing us to yeah. ask you these questions and giving some great advice to our listeners. It's a thrill for us to have you on as part of our Legends of Light series. <laughs> and uh, thanks again, man. It's great, me great meeting yeah, you Yeah, really again. great. No, th you, thank you. Thank you all. No, seriously, it was great. Thank you very much. Thanks for taking the time and being so generous with your thoughts and, and your stories and and I'm looking forward to seeing the, the newest stuff that you come out with. The, the Empire State Building work is fabulous. Yeah, it's fun. We have a good time there. Yeah, it's really um, great. We really do. Especially when we put Eminem out there ah. at the top last year. <laughs> that, was, that was great. That was one of the, you know, that was something I dreamt about for three years, to put an artist at 103. So nice. that's the kind of thing where, you know, I dreamt about it. Yeah, but love it. It took, th took three years to get there. So well, it does pay, patience. patience. That's the last patience. thing I'll patience. say. Yeah, tr patience. <laughs> Dreams come true. <laughs> well, everybody, that Hammond organ solo tells us that once again, you spent another morning listening to Light Talk. You can listen to us on iTunes, Spotify, iHeartRadio, LiveDesignOnline.com, and just about any other podcast provider out there. And be sure to follow us on Facebook and subscribe to our podcast on iTunes. That way you won't miss one second of Crazy Lumen Insanity. No guarantee is offered regarding the accuracy of any statements or opinions made on this podcast. <laughs> but just in case you decide to litigate us, the law firm of Flecht, Flocked, Flair, and Glare and their paralegal snoop will defend us until our retirement funds are depleted. Light Talk is written and produced by the Lumen Brothers, coming to you from Long Beach, Gainesville, and the Lone Star State. And join us next week when we discuss high school challenges, dimmers versus relays, what does collaboration really look like? And how much money can you really make doing this thing we love? All that and a new sponsor and more interviews coming up. Light Talk, broadcasting questionable Lumen humor and knowledge around the world. So we'll see you all next Saturday morning. Thanks again, Mark. Take care of yourself. Thank you, Mark. And good luck. Yeah, bye, Mark. You're welcome. Bye-bye from Light Thank Talk. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everyone. Light Talk.